It all started with this online game about Vikings. Nicholas and I ended up on the same team, and after each game, there was this chat session. Well, Nicholas wrote these really funny comments about the teams and the other players, and he made me laugh. I'd write replies to his comments, and he'd come back with another joke, and, you know, it was a lot of fun. Then we sort of started messaging each other when we weren't gaming. Like me, Nicholas is crazy about anything to do with Vikings. Like, he's read all the history and just knows so much. We've never met up because he lives in Bogota, in Colombia. So it's not like we're neighbours or anything. And that's the other amazing thing about him. Like, he's never left Colombia, but his English is almost perfect. We've spoken online. I don't know how his English got to be so good. I have so much more in common with Nicholas than I do with the friends I see every day. Zora and I met on this fan website for the Hunger Games. We both think this is one of the most amazing series of books we've ever read. But we both really enjoy other science fiction as well. A lot of people on the fan site just wanted to talk about the Hunger Games and nothing else. But Zora was like me and wanted to read other writers, like some of the classic writers of science fiction. Frank Herbert, Ursula K. Le Guin, Philip K. Dick, people like that. So for a while we would decide together what book to read and after every chapter we'd discuss what had happened and guess what might happen next. I really enjoyed this way of reading. It kind of made it more interesting. And then I had this idea that we could set up a book club online and, you know, include a few more people. But Zora wasn't too interested in that. I could sort of feel her pulling away. She didn't text so often and suddenly she didn't have time to read a book together. That sort of thing. That's fine. I enjoyed having an online friend, but I didn't want to have just one friend. I wanted more. In fact, now I've got a lot more. I set up the book club anyway. I joined a discussion board called Greenie, and I could see immediately that Joe was the guy with the best ideas. There were always a lot of comments about how bad things are and how the environment is suffering and all that. But Joe was practical and would always ask, OK, so what are we going to do about it? And then he would suggest something, small and simple things, but practical things. You know, like, everyone turn off your air conditioning and open the windows, sweat it out for the planet. I like people who do stuff and don't just talk about it. Then I figured out that Joe and I live in the same town. So we messaged a little and agreed to meet up. Together with some online friends and some face-to-face -face friends, We've set up a local action group. We got the city council to set aside some green areas and we're raising money to buy trees to plant there. And we've set up a website to show everyone what we're doing and we're attracting more friends who want to join in. That's the thing with online friendships. Sometimes they carry over into the real world and you can do some amazing things. Really? Oh no, the bookshop. Well, are you sure? Well, thanks for letting me know. Yes. See you soon, Joe. Bye. 
excuse me. Oh, sorry, I thought you were just looking. Um, I want something for a friend's wife. I'm going there for dinner. OK. What sort of flowers does she like? Oh, I don't know. I haven't met her yet. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, in my opinion, roses are always a good option. Um, aren't they a bit romantic? Hmm. Yes, I know what you mean. Uh, I guess something like tulips might be better. Oh, yes, they're lovely. How much are they? Um, how much are the tulips? Oh, they're... Sorry. It's OK. I'll try somewhere else. Thank you. Hello? Yes. Yes, it is. <sighs> Rachel? You OK? Oh, I'm sorry, love. I'm just a bit worried. Joe phoned today and said that the old bookshop is going to be turned into another florist's. The bookshop on the corner? I didn't know they'd sold it. Me neither. But what am I going to do? It's hard enough already to make money, but I think it's going to be impossible with another florist's in the same street. Yeah. Was Joe sure about this? I don't know. She seemed pretty certain. Well, if you ask me, it's not worth worrying about until we know for sure. I know. But I can't help it. It's on my mind. I was even rude to a customer today. Really? That's not like you. What happened? Well, I wasn't exactly rude. Just... not very helpful. Hey, don't worry about it. Let's just forget about work. Personally, I need a relaxing evening. Me too. Anyway, Tom and Becky will be here in a minute. Mm. I think we should check on the food. Yes. I don't want anything else to go wrong today. So what's Becky like? Oh. That'll be them now. How's your revision going? Not so good. I think I can remember most of the grammar, but remembering vocabulary is a bit harder, for me anyway. Yes, there are a lot of words to remember. What about you? For me, it is probably the opposite. I find the grammar hard to get my head around, but the vocabulary is a lot easier. I've been testing myself at home and it's OK. How do you manage to remember all the words, though? What's your secret? Well, it's no secret. I have this kind of system for learning words that seems to make it easy. OK. What? Well, when I get home from class, I record all the new words I've learned onto my phone. And then I might do something like go for a run and I listen to them when I'm running. And I make up these sentences with the words and say them to myself. As you're running? Yes, as I'm running. I just say the sentences quietly to myself. Do you remember what the words mean? Most of the time. If I forget, I check in my notebook when I get home from my run. And sometimes I play the words and write them down. I think the most important thing is to keep repeating them. I don't know why, but remembering the sounds of the words is important for me. Like last week, I learned the word shine, you know, like the sun is shining. And that sh sound at the beginning of the word makes me think of light that's getting brighter and brighter. Interesting. But I don't know if it would work for me. 
I need to see things written down. I need to look at the word. Right. My sister is like that too. She uses vocabulary cards. Have you tried that? No. How does that work? She has these small cards and writes all the new words on a card with a picture or a definition and an example. Sometimes a translation too. It works really well for a while. For a while? Why? What happened? She left all the cards on the train. Oh, yes. That's probably what I would do. I felt so sorry for her. After all that work... It sounds like a good idea. But it sounds like you have to be quite organized to have a card system. Yes, that's true. And to be honest, I think I may be too lazy to write all those cards and keep them with me wherever I go. You've got good grades and you've been to lots of interviews, but no one's offered you a job yet. Why? Is it because your knowledge and practical skills aren't right for the job? Well, according to one careers expert, Nancy Maynard, it's probably because you just haven't got the likability factor. Likeability is the ability to work well with people. It isn't something you can learn easily at school, but employers want it and they're quick to see it in candidates at interview. Without likability, Maynard believes, good grades and practical skills are worth very little. In the first 18 months in a job, most of an employee's success is linked to their likability, not to how well he or she does the job. Likability is much more important than other abilities, and anyone who's looking for a job should be trying their hardest to improve their own by spending time with other people. Advice for job hunters goes like this. Apply for the jobs that you want, even if you haven't got the right qualifications. If you get an interview, then impress the interviewers with your soft skills. Soft skills are your personal skills, your friendly personality, your positive attitude to work, your ability to communicate with people and your problem-solving skills. It's simple. Or is it? Is likability really more important than knowledge and experience? We took to the streets and asked some people for their opinions. People don't realise how important likability is because employers don't like to talk about it. So, they usually give other reasons for not offering someone a job. But let's be honest, if you're paying someone to do a job, you want them to work well with the people around them. Yes, soft skills and likability are much more important than specific job skills, like being able to use a computer for the employer and for yourself too. There's no such thing as a job for life anymore. Develop your soft skills, be good at working with other people and you'll always be able to get work. I've been a doctor since I graduated from medical school. I've worked at this hospital for 18 years. My practical skills and my knowledge are all that matters. Without those, I couldn't do my job. I listen to my patients, but I certainly don't believe that I need to be charming and sociable all the time. I've never believed that. I'm afraid it's true and it makes me angry. I'm 23 and I haven't worked since I left college. 
The only way to develop soft skills is to work with people, but the only way to get work is to have soft skills. It's a no-win situation. When people talk like this, it makes education and hard work sound second best. And that's simply not true. Yes, you need to be able to make a good first impression, but come on. What really matters is that you can offer practical skills and experience to an organization, not just a friendly face. Thank you. Oh, hi, Becky. Oh, hi, Rachel. <laughs> oh, oh, um, oh, no. Ah. Oh, Becky, I'm so sorry. But why? It was me that knocked it over. But I distracted you. Oh, what by saying hello? Don't worry about it. It was my fault. At least let me get you another orange juice. How's the phone? Not good. The screen's frozen. Oh dear. Have you tried turning it off and on again? I was just doing that, but still nothing. Mm. What about taking the SIM card out and drying it? That's worth a try. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. I hope I haven't lost all my contacts. I haven't saved them anywhere else. Oh no, how awful. Could you take it back to the shop? Oh, I don't think they'll do anything. I bought it over a year ago. Mm. Can you claim on your insurance? I don't have any. It's just run out a week ago. Oh, how annoying. I know. The other day I read about this trick for fixing phones that have got wet. Oh, yes. They said you put the phone in a bag of rice and apparently it dries it out. You could try that. That sounds a bit weird. I know. But there were lots of comments from people saying that it had worked. OK, I'll give it a try. What have I got to lose? Exactly. It's cheaper than buying a new phone. Hello, Fantastic Flowers. Hi, Rachel, it's Becky. Oh, hi, Becky, how are you? I'm good, and guess what? My phone's working. That rice trick worked. That's brilliant. I'm really glad to hear that. Hi, Tanya. How are things? Hi, Lynn. Things are okay. Have you done that presentation yet? The one for your bosses? Yeah, I did it yesterday. How did it go? Well, you know, the usual thing. I presented my ideas, everyone smiled and thanked me, and then said nothing. So they didn't even give their opinion? No, but I could see they didn't like the idea. The problem with the company I work for is that they're continuing to use the same ideas and aren't thinking enough about new markets. They're not thinking enough about the mobile app market at all. Isn't that why they hired you? <laughs> That's what I thought. I mean, I've been working there for just over a year now, and they haven't said yes to any of my ideas. When they offered me the job, they said things like, Oh yes, we're very interested in your creative thinking and your problem-solving skills. But do they really want to use them? I get the feeling they don't. That must be very disappointing. I think I've more or less decided I'm going to look for a new job. 
Really? Yeah. It's getting hard to keep having a positive attitude. I can understand that. And I thought your app idea was a really good one. Thanks. So, what do you think about me moving to Singapore? Singapore? Yeah, I'm thinking about making a big change. Yeah, but coming to live in Singapore, are you sure? Yeah, well, you came here to study. Why can't I go there to work? No reason, I suppose. That would be amazing. I want to travel more, and I'm really interested in Asian culture. I'd love to find out more about it. Well, yes, and there are plenty of IT jobs in Singapore, but it's kind of a busy city. Are you sure you could handle it? Absolutely. It would be fun. Great. Go for it then. I remember in primary school, Mum used to dress us in the same clothes. No, she didn't. We used to wear different clothes. So how did we swap classes and fool the teachers? We used to change our clothes before class. Did we? I don't remember that. I thought our clothes were always the same. Anyway, I liked the fact that you were always there. I always had a friend, someone to talk to. <laughs> yeah, but we didn't used to talk that much. Yes, we did. No, no, we used to play together all the time, but we were quiet. Mum says so. She says it was like we knew what each other was thinking. <laughs> That's very true. I mean, I usually know what you think about things. Well, yeah. Do you remember when we were in secondary school? <laughs> of course. I used to hate being asked the same question all the time. Are you Bianca's twin? That's when you started wearing black. Only black and nothing else. I looked good in black. And I remember what you used to wear. They were just dresses and skirts with flowers on them. Oh yeah, and they were pretty bad. <laughs> they weren't that bad. Anyway, I was trying to be different from you. But the thing that really annoyed me when we were growing up was when people tried to compare us. Right, like when they used to ask things like, Are you the one who's a little slimmer? Or are you the forgetful one? I never used to answer those questions honestly. Me neither. And I usually felt that people wanted us to compete all the time. Yeah, especially with marks. Like my teacher would say, Bianca's maths mark is better than yours. And I'd get, Martina wrote a very good essay. You could learn from her. But mum and dad never did that. No, never. They brought us up well. Hi, Mark. Hi, Tom. Hi, Paula. Hi. We're still meeting at ten, right? Yes, we are. We're in meeting room three, I think. See you in there. Yep, see you in a minute. Coffee? Yes, please. So, did you have a good weekend? It was good, thanks. But you won't believe what I did. What? Remember I told you my dad wanted a desk for his new office and I offered to help him find one online? Oh, yeah? Well, I found one. It looked perfect. Exactly what I was looking for. It was a fantastic price, too. Sounds good. Exactly. So I ordered it. Great. And it arrived on Saturday. But the funny thing is, it was really... Really small. How small? It only came up to my knees. Hey? It turned out I'd ordered a desk for a child. <laughs> no way! Mm-hmm. I forgot to check the measurements on the website. Oh, 
Oh, so what did you do? Oh, so what did you do? Well, I phoned the company to explain and luckily they agreed to give me a refund. Really? That was very good of them. Yeah, it was. But anyway, I still had to find a desk. I was looking everywhere, but I couldn't find anything. In the end, Rachel suggested I try one of those free cycling websites. Free cycling? What's that? It's where people get rid of stuff they don't want anymore. I'd never heard of it either, but there are a couple of websites for this area. I found the perfect desk straight away, and the best thing is, it's free. It's free? Yeah. I think the owner doesn't have enough space for it, so he's just giving it away. So all I have to do is go and pick it up. Wow, that's good. Are you sure it's the right size this time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll double check the measurements this time. Guys! Oh, sorry, Paula, it's my fault. I was just explaining to Tom about my desk mix-up. <laughs> It's a shame we don't know much about our great-grandfather, isn't it? Mum used to love talking about him and great-grandma. She always used to tell so many interesting stories about them, but I've got no idea where or when they met. Yeah. Well, I know he was born in England. Who, hey, great-grandpa? That's right. And he wanted to go out and see the world, didn't he? That's why he went to train as a chef, so he could get work on a ship. What kind of ship? A cruise ship. That was before the war, sometime in the 1930s. Ah, oh, right. He loved travelling, and working on a ship was the best way to see the world if you didn't have a lot of money back then. So, how did he meet Great Grandma? She was a nurse, wasn't she? And how did they both end up in Australia? I... I don't know. I guess we'll have to do some research. That was Rimsky korsakovs Flight of the Bumblebee, a piece which was recently performed to a live audience on TV by a six-year-old boy called Tsong Tsong, Song Tsong could play the piano when he was three. At the age of five, an internet clip with him at the piano made him famous. Now, he says, he wants to be able to play like Mozart. Our question today is, do we have to start young to succeed? We've all heard about kids like Tsong Tsong, Bright kids who have a particular ability in, say, music, maths or science. But do they grow up to be successful adults? And if you're over 30 and you haven't achieved your goals yet, is it too late? Ed Bickley's been looking into it for us. Ed, what have you found out? OK, well, clearly some talented children go on to do very well as adults. Take Lionel Messi. He started playing football on the street at the age of five. Soon, he was playing against much older boys and they couldn't get the ball off him. He was so good that he was able to join the Barcelona junior team when he was 11 and achieved international success at 20. Now he's one of the greatest players in the world. A real success story. Yes, but what's surprising is that most of these talented children, when they grow up, don't actually achieve much more than other adults. A recent study followed a group of talented children from 1974 until now. Less than 5% managed to become very successful adults. That does seem surprising. And now for the good news. If you haven't achieved your goals by the time you're 30, don't give up.
plenty of people have found success much later in life. British fashion designer Vivian Westwood's first job was in teaching. She always wanted to be a designer, but her successful fashion career didn't begin until she was thirty, when she started making clothes for a shop in London called Let It Rock. Then there's Andrea Bocelli. He's been able to sing well since he was a child, but he didn't become a famous classical singer until he was thirty-six. At forty-one, his album became the most successful classical album by a solo artist of all time, with five million copies sold around the world. So to do well at something, we don't have to be good at it at a young age. That's right. In most cases, talent develops with experience. You need to practice, make mistakes, get frustrated, learn from your mistakes, practice more. It's hard work. You need a lot of patience, a lot of determination. Confidence and a positive attitude help too. Say to yourself, "I can do it," and just maybe you will. And don't worry if your ten-year-old child can't play the piano. Maybe they'll be able to do it when they're a bit older. Ed, you've given us all hope. Thank you very much. Kate. Well, my friends would probably say I'm an extrovert because I'm very sociable. In social situations like a party or something, I'm usually really outgoing, you know, talkative, and I like to have a lot of fun. And I usually joke around with people and so on. I don't mind being on my own if it's not for too long, but after a while, I start feeling bored. I definitely need people to talk to, but on the other hand, I definitely have my introverted side too. You know, I think I'm basically quite a shy person. I certainly worry a lot about what people think of me. Maybe that's why I cover it up by talking a lot, <laughs> and I'm really scared of speaking to an audience. I hate it if I have to give a presentation in class or give a speech. That makes me feel really nervous, feeling like everyone's looking at me. I don't like that. Alex. Oh, I'm definitely an introvert. I'm definitely a bit reserved with people I don't know well. I don't really give myself away much, except with very close friends. Then I can sometimes be quite lively and fun to be with. People say I'm very good at telling jokes, actually. Um, I don't enjoy parties much. I don't really know what to say to people. I'd much rather be doing something on my own, maybe reading a book or going for a long walk, or maybe just going out with a couple of friends. It probably sounds really boring, but I guess I'm basically a serious person, and I'm also quite sensitive. I'd rather have an interesting conversation with someone, not just make small talk. And I suppose maybe that puts people off sometimes. And these are the photos. You haven't seen the ones of our holiday, have you? No, I haven't. Oh wow, that's a great photo. That's the hotel you stayed in, isn't it? Yes, and there's the beach. It was only a few meters from the hotel. Wow, Becky, these are really good. Thanks. I enjoyed taking them. They're amazing. Actually, can I ask a big favour? You know, I'm making a new website, don't you? Well, I need some photos of the shop for it. 
do you think you could take them? Mm, I'm not sure. I'm not a real photographer. It's just a hobby. But I really love your pictures. Will you do it? Well, if you're sure, I'd love to. Great. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mark, Tom told me about your internet shopping mistake. You bought a child's desk instead of an adult one, didn't you? It was an easy mistake to make. <laughs> Could have happened to anyone. Anyway, it all turned out well in the end. Actually, I'm going to get the desk on Saturday. Oh, do you need a hand? I'm sure Tom will. Oh, yeah. I need a bit of muscle. <laughs> <laughs> it would be great if you could, wouldn't it, Mark? Yeah, I was wondering how I was going to move it on my own. Why not? But could I ask you a favour in return, Rachel? Yes, of course. What? Oh, I'll tell you later. So, what do you need? Well, I'm going to ask Becky to marry me. Wow, that is great news! <laughs> Thanks. But I wondered if you could come with me to buy the ring. I've never done this before and I don't know where to start. Yes, of course I could. Oh, that is brilliant! <laughs> What are you two gossiping about? Oh, nothing. Sheena. Last year, I had some free time and a bit of money to spend. I'd always wanted to go walking and climbing in the Himalayas, but I didn't want to go on my own, and none of my friends wanted to go. So I found a website called Travel Groups where you can contact other people who want to go to the same places as you and you can join up and go together as a group. Anyway, I found three other people to go with and we all met in Delhi in North India and we travelled together. It worked out really well. I think websites like this are a good idea because lots of people don't want to travel on their own and it works as long as everyone's reasonably sociable. I'm quite self-confident and I think I'm an extrovert so I think I'm quite good at getting on with people and making friends. Alia I had a few months off after university, so I looked on the internet for volunteer work and found a really good website for last-minute volunteer jobs called the Volunteer Community Project. It was good because you can arrange things straight away and they pay your fares and you get basic accommodation and food. You don't earn money, but you don't really spend much either. I went to London and worked there with young children from problem families. I didn't have any experience, but that doesn't matter. You just need to be able to get on with kids and understand what they need. I never realised before, but actually, it seems like I've got a natural talent for teaching children. So it was a really great experience, and now I've decided to train as a primary school teacher. Brad. I really needed to earn some money, and I couldn't get a proper job. Someone told me about this website called Short Work, where people offer short jobs for a few days or a couple of weeks that they need doing, like helping out with things or fixing things for people. I'm quite good at things like that and I know a bit about electricity and plumbing. I found this advert for a family who've got a large house and needed someone to do some basic work on it. So I went along and chatted to them and they gave me the job. 
I think they could see that I was quite serious about it and I was determined to work hard. It was really good. I was only there for two weeks, but in that time I managed to clear their garden, mend their garden fence, I painted three rooms for them and I got their kitchen light working. <laughs> so, not bad for two weeks work. This is my favourite animal, the orangutan. Unfortunately, this great ape is endangered. It's terrible that people are cutting down the trees in the area where it lives. If we're not careful, its home will be completely destroyed. Fortunately, there are several conservation projects working to save this beautiful creature. The ice in the Arctic is melting. Some people say that the melting ice is natural, that human beings are not causing climate change. But we need to do something about it and fast. The weather is getting stranger. Some scientists think that many species will not be able to survive if the temperature changes too much. Pollution is a big problem here. The air is often like a dirty grey fog. You can hardly see what's in front of you. A lot of people are getting ill. The government needs to limit the number of cars and factories. But we can't do anything without the support of the local people. The problem is, everyone wants to drive. Are they environmentally friendly in Costa Rica? Do they protect their rainforests and animals? Well, yes, they do. The government is doing a lot. But it takes quite a long time for forests to recover if they've already been cut down. They'll probably grow back, but not immediately. Are you going to work in the rainforests? No, no, I'm not. I'll be by the sea. I'm going to work on a project that looks after turtles. Turtles? <laughs> That's very cool. But how do you look after turtles? I mean, what do you do? Well, to be honest, I don't really know. <laughs> Tomorrow I'm meeting someone who worked on the project and she's going to tell me about the kinds of things I'm going to do. So, who else works on the project? Just people from overseas or local people too? I'm not sure about that either. Perhaps I'll work with local people as well. So, you're off to save the world. <laughs> I think that's great. <laughs> Don't know about saving the world, but I'll definitely be able to save some turtles. And I'm going to make the most of my time in Costa Rica and learn some Spanish too. Let me know how things go. Sure. Actually, I'm going to keep a blog so I'll write regular updates on the blog and you can follow that. Good idea. I'm sure you'll have a great time. Yeah, so am I. I visited biologist Andrew Parker to find out more about how the natural world has inspired everyday objects. Andrew, hello. What's this little animal you've got here? It's a thorny dragon lizard from the Australian desert. As you can see, it's quite small, about 20 centimetres long. But it's an amazing animal. You see, what I'm really interested in is what this little creature can teach us about collecting water. OK. So, as I said, this lizard lives in the desert in Australia. And, as you know, it's an incredibly dry place. But this lizard manages to live there very successfully. And we've discovered one of the reasons for this. If the lizard puts a foot somewhere wet, even just a tiny, tiny bit wet, 
its skin pulls the water up and over its whole body. When the water reaches the lizard's mouth, it drinks it. That's very clever. Yes. On the lizard's skin, well, in fact, in the skin, we discovered there's like a system of very, very small pipes. So the skin collects the water and these pipes pull it towards the lizard's mouth. That sounds really efficient. Well, right, yeah. So, you see, we want to copy that system and use it in a device that collects water. If we are successful, the device will provide water for people who live in very dry environments. That's fantastic. And what other ideas have we taken from nature? Engineers are doing a lot with robots these days. For example, there's the rescue robot. It's just like a spider because it moves on eight legs. And so it can move very quickly and make itself very small. So these rescue robots will be able to help people who are stuck in small spaces or who are trapped in buildings, for example, if there's an earthquake. So they'll be able to help save lives. Exactly. And then we're looking at seashells, which are very strong, but at the same time, they're very light. They don't weigh much at all. Scientists have discovered that seashells are made of lots of tiny blocks that fit together, but this makes them really hard to break. The plan is to copy this material to make safety equipment, such as gloves and helmets. So this material will protect people like a shell protects a turtle? That's right. And again, this could help save lives. Hi. Oh, hi, Becky. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. So are you ready for your photo shoot? Huh. I guess so. The shop looks great. Oh, that's because of Tina. She spent the morning cleaning up. Well, she did a great job. So, Tina, are you going to be in the photos too? No. I hate having my photo taken. I see. Anyway, if you're ready... Oh, make sure you get my good side. You look great. <laughs> Thank you. So, how do you want to do this? Uh, let me see. I think it would be best if I just take some natural shots of you looking busy with the flowers. OK. <laughs> Mm, that's really good. Oh, shall I carry on? Yes, that's great. <laughs> so, why did you become a florist? Well, that's a good question. I've always loved flowers, ever since I was a little girl. So it seemed a natural thing for me to do. I think it's really important that you do something that you enjoy. Fantastic. Yeah, it must be nice to have a job like yours. The freedom you have and you can be creative and you're your own boss. You sound like you don't enjoy your job. No, not at the moment. Not for a while, actually. Really? What's wrong with it? Oh, lots of things. For instance, all I seem to do is deal with other people's problems, like issues with their pay or holidays. And I hate being stuck inside an office all day, staring at the clock. Oh dear. I wish I had a job where I could travel the world, spread my wings, be free. <laughs> Such as? I don't know. That's the problem. Hmm. Lovely. Can I see? Sure. Here you go. Hmm. 
That's great. Thank you. <laughs> well, how about becoming a professional photographer? You're really good. Mm, I don't know. Tina, how about a quick shot of you and Rachel together? Do I have to? Oh, go on. Just stand by Rachel for a moment. So look at this. There are loads of photography courses you can do. Photojournalism, for example, or portrait photography. Thanks. That's great. But we're meant to be choosing which photos you want for your website. OK. But I just think it's something that you should consider. Well, maybe. Let's look at the photos for now. Hmm. Hey, Becky, these are great. Thank you. I think this is the best one. Rachel, we can't see you in that one. OK. <laughs> Let me see. Um, I think this one. I'm on my way to Lane Cove, where between 20 and 30 whales have come ashore and can't get back out to sea again. When I get to Lane Cove, I'm meeting Sam Collins from the Marine Life Service. I'm going to help Sam and a team of local people to try and save these whales. Okay. I've just arrived and talked to Sam. It's quite cold, so I think I'll change into my wetsuit before going down onto the beach to work with other people who've come here to help these whales. So far, about 50 people have turned up and more are coming. If more people come, we'll have a chance of succeeding. So, I'm in a team of four people and we're looking after just one poor whale. Sam says it's female, and what we've done is we've covered her with wet towels and we're pouring buckets of water over her to keep her cool. We have to be careful where we put the towels. If we cover her blowhole, she won't be able to breathe. Sam says our whale's in good condition and he thinks she'll survive. The tide's coming in soon. I'm going to help dig up sand around the whale to make a hole. When the water comes in, it'll fill up the hole. Better get going. Yes! Success! The tide came in. Our whale floated again. There were about five of us. We pushed and pushed and she fought back a bit. Then she took off. <sighs> what a great feeling. She's swimming back out to sea. I think she's going to be okay. Kim from England. Well, I've been living in Brazil now for a long time and my friends here always say that there's real time and then there's Brazilian time. And I think it's true in a way. There is Brazilian time and it moves a bit more slowly. So if a meeting starts at 10 o'clock, you don't have to be there at 10 o'clock, you can come maybe 15 or 20 minutes later and that's fine. Or if people invite you for a party at 7 o'clock, you definitely shouldn't arrive at 7 o'clock because it will be too early and no one will be there. You should arrive maybe half an hour or even an hour later. Some friends of mine here are from the UK and Germany 
and they grew up with this idea that you always have to be punctual. And they sometimes find it quite difficult when people don't show up on time. But I really like it. It's so much more relaxed. And I think people have more time for each other. And that's really important. The funny thing is that because I'm from England and people know that English people are supposed to be punctual, they expect me to show up on time. They always say, no, you mustn't be late. You must come on time, even though they're often late themselves. <laughs> We always laugh about that. Will from the USA. I remember when I was working in Nigeria, there were a few things I had to get used to. Like, for example, if you're talking to someone you don't know well, you shouldn't look right at them, and you mustn't look them in the eye. Instead, you look down slightly. And when I was first there, I found it really strange. I thought, well, don't people like me or what? But, in fact, it's a sign you respect the other person. So I had to get used to that. Actually, it's the opposite from the USA. In the USA, you should definitely look the other person in the eye when you talk. People think that shows you're honest. But in West Africa, people think that seems aggressive and it's polite to look away slightly. But I have to say, I never really got used to it. I always wanted people to look at me. That's my culture, I guess. Tasia from Greece. I've been in Britain for a couple of years now, so everything seems fairly normal to me. But one thing I still find a bit strange is attitudes towards children, especially bedtimes. Like, if you're getting together in the evening and there are adults and children, at a certain time, maybe 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock, all the children have to go to bed. And after that, it's just adults. And for me, that seems really strange because in Greece... Children can usually stay up as long as they want. If there's a party going on or a family get-together, you know, they don't have to go to bed at a fixed time. And if they feel tired, they can just lie down for a bit. And my friends in the UK tell me it's important... They have to sleep because they have school the next day and so on, and I do get that. I can see it's very sensible and their children probably learn better. But I just think children should join in the life of the family and it's a pity if they can't be part of it, you know? That seems more important to me. Japan has by far the highest number of vending machines per person in the world. In fact, it has 5.6 million of them. That's one vending machine for every 20 people. These machines sell all sorts of things from coffee to bananas, flowers to umbrellas. In a busy society, they play an important role. It's much cheaper for sellers to run a vending machine than it is to run a shop. And customers love them because they can buy things more quickly and easily. And we're not talking here just about drinks and cold snacks. In Japan... There are even vending machines that serve hot food. Japanese students love curry and rice. It's one of the country's most popular meals. And, sure enough, 
There are actually a few places where you can get it hot and ready to eat straight from a machine. That's definitely more convenient than cooking at home. But is curry and rice from a machine as good as curry and rice from a restaurant? Our reporter Luke went to the small town of Awashi to find out. Okay, I've just put my 500 yen into the vending machine, and I'm waiting for my curry and rice to appear. Hmm, it's taking a bit longer than I imagined. Okay, so my meal is here. I just have to open the packet of steamed rice. Hmm,、uh, the curry smells. Well, it smells okay, like a lot of instant curries. Right, let me go and find somewhere to sit down and try it. Okay, this will do. Well. Th- This is fine. It's actually much better than I expected. What can I say? I think it might be the best vending machine meal I've ever eaten. Just not the best curry I've ever eaten. For five hundred yen, that's less than four pounds. I can't really complain. But I think next time I'll spend a bit more and go to a proper restaurant. Hi, am I late? No, you're right on time. So are you ready to go shopping? I am so excited. <laughs> I still can't believe you're going to ask Becky to marry you. Well, I've been thinking about that. Oh no! Don't tell me that you've changed your mind. Oh no, not at all. I just <sighs> don't know how to do it. What do you mean? Well. Do you think I should take her somewhere special?、Um, yes. Maybe Paris. I was thinking I could propose at the top of the Eiffel Tower. Wow, just like in the movies. Do you think that's too much? No, but is it what Becky would really like?、Um, I just don't know. <laughs> what do you suggest? Well, if I were you, I'd take her somewhere special. Exactly, like Paris. I, I mean. Special for the two of you. Like Mark took me to the place where we first met. It was really romantic because he clearly thought about it. Where did you two first meet? At the office where we both worked. Oh, okay. But there must be somewhere special. Hmm, maybe. How about the restaurant where we had our first date? Now that sounds like a possibility. Anyway, let's go and look for this ring. So, what about the ring? What would you buy? A big diamond, right? So she can show it to her friends. Seriously, Tom, do you know Becky at all? It's much better to buy something that's her style, something that you think she'll like. She doesn't need to show off. I'm getting this all wrong. <laughs> That's why I'm here. Come on. How about that ring? Oh, that's a nice one.、Mm. It's fifteen hundred pounds. I don't believe it. That's ridiculous. Tom, it's Becky over there. You're kidding. What should we do? Quick, let's go in. Jeff. I like eating out, but I don't really like expensive restaurants. It's not the money so much as the atmosphere. The waiters are often quite unfriendly, and you feel you have to talk quietly. Or I do anyway. No one seems to be very relaxed, and the food can be good, but you don't often get much on your plate. I'd much rather go somewhere where the food's good and you don't have to pay so much. 
Fabio. I love going to cafes, either with friends or on my own. I sometimes take a book or a newspaper to read, or I just order a coffee and sit there. I sometimes start talking to someone. In fact, I've got quite a good friend who I met in a cafe. We started talking and then found out we both liked the same kind of music. I like pavement cafes best. You don't have to think about anything. You can just sit and watch the world go by. It's a great way to pass time, I think. Very relaxing. Carla. I really love dancing. So I often go out with a group of friends to a club in the evening. It's such a good way to spend the evening. We usually order some food, maybe just some starters and some grilled meat and something to drink, and then we start dancing. There's a favorite place of mine where they have live music and we all dance Latin American dances like salsa or merengue. It's quite cheap. You have to pay something to get in, but it's not much and it's always full of people. Maybe 200 people all dancing. It's got an amazing atmosphere.